1999 Canadian Open Mathematics Challenge Part A. Determine the sum of all odd positive two-digit integers that are divisible by 5. All right, well, the two-digit ones that are divisible by 5 obviously are going to be 10, 15, 20, 25, and so on, right? So let's just list them all. 40, 45, 50, and so on. And then now we have to look at only the odd. So let's get rid of all the even ones. So cross all of the even numbers out. And then the ones that are left, you just have to add them all up. So you can do that manually. Uh, or you can, however you want to add them up. So 15 plus 25 plus 35 and so on. And when you add up the sum, it is 495. That is the answer. A rough sketch of the graph y is equal to 2x plus 4 times x squared minus 3x is shown. For what values of x is y greater than or equal to 0? Well, let's start with the equation that they gave us, 2x plus 4. And then we have x squared minus 3x. If we factor out a 2, this becomes x plus 2. If we factor out an x here, this part would be x minus 3. So immediately from this, if we were to set that equal to 0, we can get the roots. The roots are obviously going to be minus 2, 0, and plus 3. So on this graph, this is obviously this point right here is minus 2. This is 0. And this point is plus 3. So they want you to figure out when is, um, for what values of x is y greater than or equal to 0. So y greater than or equal to 0 basically means this segment of the graph. That's when it's above 0, notice. And then it also will be above 0 here at any point after that. Okay, well, that seems to me that it, it occurs when x is between 0 and negative 2, but also equal to, so don't forget the equal signs there, and also when x is greater than or equal to 3. And of course, x is an element of all real numbers, so you can put that in there. And that's it. So y is greater than or equal to 0 when I'll just put that in there. Solve for x the following equation. 4 over 9 to the power of x times 8 over 27 to the power of 1 minus x is equal to 2 thirds. Well, I think just by looking at this immediately, we're going to have to get the same numbers uh, in terms of numerator and denominator. And I have a hunch that that is going to be 2 on the numerator and 3 on the denominator since that's what you have on that side. Okay, I don't think that'll be that hard. This is 2 to the power of 2. This is 3 to the power of 2, and that's all to the power of x. This is 2 to the power of 3, 8. And 27 is 3 to the power of 3, all to the power of 1 minus x. And that is 2 over 3. So this will be 2 to the power of 2x over 3 to the power of 2x. This will be 2 to the power of 3 minus 3x using basic exponent laws or rules. And this is 3 to the power of 3 minus 3x. And that's 2, to the, or 2 over 3. Okay. Now let's combine the exponents. So it will be 2. And you're going to add this and this, right? So that will be 3 minus x. 3 minus x. And then on the bottom... It will be 3 as the base, and then the exponent will be 3 minus x also. And that's 2 over 3. Well, that's really 2 to the power of 1 and 3 to the power of 1. So since the bases are the same, the exponents must be the same. So that means that 3 minus x is equal to 1. So therefore, x is equal to 2. And you get the exact same uh, result with the bottom since it's the exact same numbers. And I think that's it. x is equal to Solve the system of equations for x. Okay. Uh, many ways to approach this question. I'm just going to try to get it all in terms of one variable, and then that will 
help me solve. So for the first equation I can isolate for z, it'll be just x plus 2y minus 5. From the second equation, what can I do here? Um, well, what I can do at this point is I can use the fact that z is equal to that and then just substitute it in the second one. So it'll be 3x plus 2y plus z, but z I just got was x plus 2y minus 5, and that's all equal to 11. And this will help me uh, put it in terms of just two variables. So this looks like 4x plus 4y equals 16, and that means x plus y is equal to 4, and that means y is equal to 4 minus x. Okay, great. All right, so where do we go from here? We can just substitute that finding into here, and we can get Z in Z, uh, whichever country you're from, uh, in terms of X. So X plus 2Y, but Y we just figured out was 4 minus X minus 5 is equal to Z or Z. And that means X plus 8 minus 2X minus 5 is equal to Z. And what is this going to be? Uh, 3 minus x is equal to z. Okay, great. So we got y in terms of x, z in terms of x. So now we can substitute it back into any of them and then solve for x. So which one do you want to use here? Um, I'll just use this one, I guess. Might as well since we haven't used it yet. Okay, so x plus 2, y, but y is 4 minus x, all squared minus z squared, but z is 3 minus x, all squared, and that is 15. Okay, so this is x plus, that's 8 minus 2x, 8 minus 2x, all squared, and then this is just going to be the same, and then let's, uh, let's see here, 8 minus x, all squared, and then at this point now we can expand, and that'll be 64 minus 16x plus x squared. And this is going to be, be careful because I got this negative here. Minus 9 minus 6x, but with the negative it'll be plus 6x plus x squared. And with the negative it'll be minus x squared. Okay, oh, nice. This cancels with that. This becomes minus 10x. And then 64 minus 9 is 55. And then 55... 55 minus 15 is 40, and that's equal to 0. So that means 40 is equal to 10x, and therefore x is equal to 4. Great. And then uh, just for the sake of completion, y would be 0, and z would be 3 minus 4, which is negative 1. So there you go. There's your x, y, z. Determine all x which satisfy 2 sine x cubed plus 6 sine squared x minus sine x minus 3 is equal to 0 for x between 0 and 2 pi. Okay, to make our lives a little bit easier, I'll let sine of x equal 2 a. And therefore, this just becomes 2 a to the power of 3 plus 6 a squared minus a minus 3 is equal to 0. All right, now we've got to do some factoring here. Let's see here. Two, if I factor out a 2a squared, I will get a plus 3, I believe. And then if I factor out a negative 1, I'll get a plus 3. Now factor out the a plus 3, and when you do, the other one will be 2a squared minus 1. So we factored this very nicely. And that means that a is either negative 3 or a is either... Uh, well, 2a squared minus 1 would be 0, so a squared would be 1 half, so that means a is plus or minus the root of 1 half. Okay, well, one thing we know for sure is that this is not possible because a represents sine x, right? And the sine of x, no matter what x is, is always between 1 and negative 1. You can, if you remember the sine graph, it, all, it just oscillates back and forth between 1 and negative 1 if you look at the, the y-axis. 
So this is most likely the scenario that sine of x is plus or minus the square root of a half. Okay, so that means the sine of x is either the square root of a half positive or the sine of x is equal to negative square root of a half. And with your, you're not allowed to use calculators, but if this is sort of a basic one, right? Everybody should know this in terms of what is x. Square root of a half, x would be uh, pi by 4, pi over 4, which is 45 degrees. And I'll just draw it here on the, on the graph. So remember, the question told us we only have to look at x between uh, 0 and 2 pi. So that's basically going to be like that. So you're looking at when it's a positive a 1 over 2 square root. So what is that, about 0.7 approximately? So either there, there, and the negative, that's going to be here and here. So you're going to have four values. The first value I just wrote is 45 degrees. So that's this right here, pi by 4. The next value is here. And that's easy because that's just uh, this minus 45, that being pi, right? This is going to be 180 degrees, which is pi. So pi minus pi over 4 is... 3 pi over 4, which is 135 degrees. Okay, great. And then from this guy, those solutions would be x is uh, 180 plus 45, so 225 degrees, which is 5 by pi by 4. 225 degrees. That's this one right here. This one. And then this one is 360 minus 45, so that's 315, which in pi's would be 7 pi over 4. And that is the solution to number 5. A trapezoid DEFG is circumscribed about a circle that has center C in radius 2, as is shown. The shorter of the two parallel sides, DE, has length 3, and angles DEF and EFG are right angles. Determine the area of the trapezoid. All right, so we've got to label this now. So that is going to be obviously the radius. Let's bring it all the way down. That's going to be a radius. And this here, that line will be important. This is a tangent point, correct? And this line right here will be necessary. And this is also a tangent point. So let's label this now. Uh, they say the radius is 2. So this is 2, this is 2, this is 2, this is 2, and so on. And then what else do we know? The length is 3 of DE. So from here to here is 3. So I'll just put a 3 up here. Now from here to here is 2. That's helpful. So that means from here to here is 1, correct? Because 2 plus 1 is 3. And then we have to use this rule that if you have a tangent point, so let me explain this rule carefully. Most of you know it, but if you don't, let's say you have a point, right? It's D in this case. And from that point, you draw a line to the tangent point, which is right here. That's a tangent point. And then you draw another line from the same point D to another tangent point, which is that point right there. By rules, if this diagram was drawn to scale, those two segments are equal. So this will be equal to that. So if that's one, this is one, right? So by the same principle, this would be the same as that. Now I haven't labeled it yet, so I'll just label it X. X is from there to there. And similarly, from here to here would also be x. All right, and then one final line, hopefully it's not too confusing, is from d all the way down, all the way down to the bottom. Okay, I think that should be good enough. Now, if you have a trapezoid, right, any trapezoid, let's say like that, and the dimensions are a, b, and the height is h, the area is equal to a plus b over 2 times h. 
that's the area. So just in case you forgot. So I'm going to use that same uh, uh, formula to figure out the area of this trapezoid. Now, we know that from here to here is 3. So let me just label that there, 3. From there to there, because from here to here was 3. And I think that is pretty much all we need. And then we just need to do one final step. And we should be able to figure this out. Okay, so I want you to figure out what is from here to here. Now remember, don't get confused. X was from there to there. So you have to figure out what's from there to there. Well, that shouldn't be that hard because from here to here is 1 because it's the same as the guy up there. So from there to there is X. So you just have to subtract 1 to get the value from here to here. So I'll just put that in here like this. That is x minus 1. Okay? And then the hypotenuse here of that triangle is x plus 1, correct? And then this distance, top to bottom, well, that's 4, right? This is 2, that's 2. It's basically the diameter of the circle. So that's 4. So from this triangle, we get a Pythagorean relationship where x minus 1 squared plus 4 squared is equal to x plus 1 squared. Great. Let's expand this. x squared minus 2x plus 1 plus 16 is equal to x squared plus 2x plus 1. All right, great. The x squareds cancel, and I get 16 is equal to 4x, and therefore x is 4. All right, and I think I should be able to figure out the area now. Area, using this formula, A, well, A is that distance, which is 3. B is this distance. Well, X is 4, and um, X was from here to here, and then from here to here is 2, right? It's the same as that guy. So that bottom is 6 and then divided by 2, and then the height, the height is top to bottom, which is 4. It's just the diameter of the circle. So we have, what is that, 9 times 2, 18. 18 is the area of the trapezoid. The sector OAB of a circle with center O has perimeter of 12. Determine the radius of the circle, which maximizes the area of the sector. Okay, so I'll just label this theta. And therefore, they're saying the perimeter of the sector. So the entire, the entire region, I guess, not just the arc. So the perimeter looks like this segment, which is the radius of the uh circle, and this segment, which is also the radius of the circle, and then this arc AB. So the perimeter of that sector OAB is R plus R plus AB, and I put a little arc there to show that it's an arc. They told me the perimeter is 12, so 12 is equal to 2R plus the arc AB, the length of that arc. So AB, the length of that arc, is 12 minus 2R. Okay, great. So far we haven't really accomplished anything, but this is a good beginning. I just want to tell you or remind you that the circumference of a circle is equal to pi times the di diameter, which you probably already know, or pi times 2 times the radius. Correct? All right. Now, the relationship between this arc and the entire circumference is the same as the relationship between this angle and the entire angle, which is 360. So that means that AB, which is the arc, over the circumference is equivalent to theta over the entire angle, which is 360. 
And this is very important. And it makes sense, right? It should be. Now, AB, we don't know, but we know the circumference is equal to pi times 2R. And theta over 360, we just leave alone because we don't know what theta is. And then AB, we just got as 12 minus 2R over pi 2R is equal to theta over 360. And then I think we can divide through by 2, and that would be 6 minus R over pi R is equal to theta over 360. Yeah. Okay, now we can concentrate on the area, which is what they want us to figure out. The area of that segment is the area of the full circle multiplied by just the fraction of the angle, which is theta over 360. That's how you figure out the area of that sector. Okay, well, theta over 360, we just got over here, was 6 minus r over pi r times pi r squared. Well, pi's cancel, one of the r's cancel, so we have 6 minus r times r. If you multiply this out, you get 6r minus r squared. Okay, now at this point, how do we figure out the value of r which maximizes the area? This is something known as completing the square. So what that means is that this is obviously a quadratic. This quadratic uh, sort of looks like that, right? So if we can figure out if this is, say, the r on the axis, and this is the a, if we can figure out what is this value, then we can figure out the value of r that maximizes a. And you do that by completing the square. And completing the square is something that I'm sure you know, but if you don't, I'll do it slowly. So let's rearrange this, minus r squared plus 6r. And this is a relatively easy one to complete the square. So what you do is first, you have to make sure that you bring the coefficient out, because we have to have no coefficient or basically a coefficient of 1 in order to complete the square. So in this case, we just factor out the negative. That makes this minus 6r. Okay, so then what we do, I'll just put a negative 1 there. Now, to complete the square, you look at this coefficient right here, which in this case is minus 6. You take half of that, which is minus 3, and then you square it. And when you square it, you get 9. So this becomes minus 6r, but then you add 9, and then you subtract 9 immediately. That's how you complete the square. When you do, the first three terms will factor very nicely, and in this case, it's r minus 3, all squared. And then don't forget to kick out the last term out of the brackets, and then when you do, it's positive 9. So what does this mean? This means that when r is equal to 3, the area is 9, because when r is 3, this whole thing vanishes, and all you're left with is 9. So on the graph, it basically would be like, this is 3. When r is 3, a would be 9. It's not drawn to scale, but you understand. And what are they asking for? Determine the radius of the circle, which maximizes the area. Okay, well, the area of the circle, or the radius of the circle, that maximizes the area is radius equal to? Three. Find the smallest positive integer k so that the expression 14k plus 17 over k minus 9 becomes a fraction in the form pd over qd where p, q, d are positive integers, p and q have no common divisors, and neither q nor d equals 1. Well, 14k plus 17 over k minus 9, I'm going to write this in a, a mixed form, meaning I've got to uh, divide this out. So that's not a problem. k minus 9, let's do our long division. All right, so k goes into 14k 14 times, right? So when you multiply this times this, you get 14k. And then 14 times negative 9 is, what is it, uh, minus 126? Okay. So then we subtract these. This is 0. 17 minus minus 126 is positive 143. 
and that's it. So it was a fairly easy one. So that means this is equal to 14 times k minus 9 plus 143. This right here, if we were to um, all over k minus 9. Okay, so what that does, actually this whole thing is over k minus 9, sorry. So what that does is allow us to write it as 14 plus 143 over k minus 9. So this expression has been modified slightly into that expression right there. And they're telling us that that is equivalent to this PD over QD, like that. Okay. Now, uh, before I continue, I want to explain s uh, something with some numbers. Otherwise, it will get too confusing if I use letters. It will look too abstract. So, for example, if I said that 4 is divisible into 16, that's an accurate statement, right? But then if I said 4 is divisible into 20, that's also accurate. And then what you can do is you can say that 4 is also divisible into 20 minus, say, something multiplied by this guy, say 2 times 16. That's also accurate. So in this case, what's that? Uh, minus 12? Does 4 go into minus 12? Sure it does. So that is something I wanted to show you because now I'm going to use letters and it might get a little abstract, but it shouldn't be that difficult to understand. So let's talk about this now. In order for D to be in the denominator like that, if you look at the original one, they're saying it's PD over QD, like that. That must mean that if this is in the denominator and that is in the denominator, then that means that QD is equal to K minus 9 or some sort of uh, uh, multiple, right? So that means that D divides into K minus 9. D is divisible into K minus 9. All right, great. Now, D is also on the numerator, and the numerator is 14K plus 17. So that means that D is divisible into 14K plus 17. Now, just like here, a combination will also hold true. So D will also be divisible into a combination. And in this case, our combination is right here. We've sort of given it to us. Right here, 14 times k minus 9. So we can combine this 14k plus 17. And just like how I did over here, I can subtract the 14 times k minus 9. And that should hold true for divisibility. And if we expand this, this becomes 14k minus 14k, right? These two cancel. And then 17 minus or uh, plus 14 times 9. So it will be 17 minus 14 times negative 9. And that means this is 143. So d is divisible into 143. Now, 143 is not a prime number, right? I think it's, uh, what, 11 times 13? Yeah, it's 11 times 13. So D is divisible into 143, but 143 is really just 11 times 13. So D can be either 11 or 13. All right, let's see what happens. Let's see what value of K we get for D equals 11 and D equals 13. 13. Okay, so when d is equal to 11, uh, we are going to get the following. Now, we have to choose a value for q, 
and they're saying that P, Q, and D are positive integers, and neither Q nor D equals 1, okay? So I've got D equals 11. So for Q, I can't choose 1 because they're saying that Q does not equal 1. So let's start with Q equals 2, and let's see what we get. Okay, so that means... If we look at this part here, that means that QD is equal to K minus 9. Q is 2. D is 11. That's K minus 9. So K minus 9 is equal to 22. And therefore, K is equal to 31. All right. Well, what happens if we keep going? If Q is equal to 3? Well, if Q is equal to 3, this will be 33 right here. And that will mean K is 33, uh, 33 plus 9, which is 42. We're going to keep getting bigger values of K. And we want the smallest, right? They want the smallest positive integer K. So we're going up with values of Q or just give, is going to give us bigger values of K. So let's just stay with the 31 for now. But now I have to test out D equals 13. If D equals 13, what happens? Okay. Well, if D equals 13, let's see. Again, let's start with our smallest Q, which is 2. That means QD, we make it equivalent to K minus 9. That's 2, that's 13. K minus 9, so that's 26. 26 plus 9 is 35. Okay. Well, obviously, 35 is greater than 31. So this is the smallest possible value of K. If you go up to Q equals 3, you'll see that those numbers for K will just get higher and higher. So based on our testing, we got K equal 31 is the highest. So that means that our original expression, which was this guy right here, up here, when K is 31, if we substitute it in, 31 plus 17 over 31 minus 9. That is 451 over 22. And that, and 11 factors from top and bottom. And we get a 41 and a 2. So this is exactly what they had in mind, where this is your P, D over Q, D. This is my D. D is 11, which I had um, figured out over there. This is my Q, which I figured out. And this one is P, right here, 41. So there you go. That's the solution for number 8.